Hi all. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I am just noticing that my, there we go, that my video was frozen. And of course the video always freezes on the most attractive face that you're making at the moment. Uh, hi, it is wonderful to uh, have you here. appreciate you being uh, here for the webinar. Uh, my name is Brad Zdenek. I'm the Innovation Strategist for the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. I help run the uh, COIL rig program. And what we're going to try to do today is we're going to try to uh, basically run through what the COIL rig process is, uh, what it entails, the criteria for selection, uh, the way in which you can put your proposal together. Uh, and what I'll be doing throughout is trying to give you some tips and tricks uh, that uh, have been picked up over the last uh, eight cycles. This will be the ninth round of rig funding that we are going to be going into now in, in November. Uh, so we picked up a lot of tips and tricks, ideas uh, for uh, best conveying your message of what your project is and uh, best aligning yourself to the criteria to make certain that you have the best chance of funding. Uh, so I'll be giving, some, giving you some of those tips and tricks as we go along. I did ask uh, in the chat if you wouldn't mind going in and uh, letting me know who you are, uh, why you're here, uh, are you interested in submitting for a rig, are you interested in being a reviewer in an upcoming round, uh, are you just curious, uh, or are you here for someone else, or are you a uh, are you a past rig submitter proposer that just wants to to learn about the new RFP and uh, learn about some things that you could do to modify your proposal? Uh, if you don't mind popping that into the chat box, I'll be looking over there and uh, and trying to read as we go along. Uh, I will right now. Uh, how many do we have? Well. We have a bit too many for uh, turning on audio, so if you wouldn't mind also, if you have questions as we go along, uh, go ahead and type your questions into the chat box uh, there, and what I'll do is I will keep uh, referencing back to that and seeing if there are any questions, and I'll try to answer them as we go along. Uh, so feel free to use that, uh, that chat box uh, to pose any questions, just to chat with one another, uh, or anything, or make comments if you'd like. You will notice uh, there are a few different pods on the screen here. On the left-hand side, you'll see a proposal section. That's going to basically frame out our discussion for today. We're going to go through the proposal, talk about the different sections, what they include, what they entail, and the best way of formatting those to, to position, your, position yourself for funding. Uh, there is also an important date section, bottom left-hand corner, most important date, uh, particularly if you're looking for uh, submitting for funding. The most important date being 11-14, November 14th. That is the due date for rig proposals, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And I'll show you where you will actually submit those in a few minutes. Uh, but that is the due date. And you'll also notice the dates that follow uh, are a pretty tight timeline for both review of the proposals and then finally announcement of the uh, grantees uh, for this proposal process. We, the deadline being November 14th, funding is in hand by January 1st. Uh, Practically, it's when you come back, so the following week. But January 1st, the money is released. So you can see it's a very tight process. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture the great ideas just as they come around uh, so that we don't have to wait six months, eight months for review processes when an idea can either be uh, taken over by someone else or whether uh, the funding, the individuals around the idea can disperse and have that idea uh, fall flat or, or fall apart. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture the momentum that you may have for your great ideas uh, by having a quick turnaround here. We'll get into the details of the grants in a second, in, in a second but let me first give you kind of the, the broad view of, of the research initiation grants, what they are and why they are. Um, so the RIGs, the research initiation grants, and I'll call them RIGs throughout the rest of the, the webinar, uh, the RIGs are really intended to provide seed funding uh, during the development stage and proof of concept stage of your ideas, uh, research projects, development projects, all focused on enhancing teaching and learning through some sort of online innovation. Uh, we'll get into what online innovation means uh, in a little bit because that has been a, a confusing point for some. But really, if you can think about any sort of innovation that you have related to teaching and learning that uses a, a networked technology, that uses an app, that uses a web-based platform, that uses some sort of technological hardware, software, uh, these are the types of things that we're talking about. 
Uh, and what these seed grants are for is to really get these ideas off the ground. Uh, so very often, those who are proposing for uh, research initiation grants do not have something in hand yet. They haven't built the thing. They haven't researched the thing yet. The grant is really intended to help you get that thing. And very importantly, to position yourself for the future of what that project will be. So we all know that very often NSF, IES, NIH, these types of grants have expectations of some sort of either prototype or proof of concept or preliminary research data collection related to an idea in order to, uh, to earn that funding from those large granting agencies. What COIL is trying to do is we're trying to give you the, uh, essentially the stopgap, the, the bridge from the idea in your head to being able to get to that larger grant funding. And we've been very successful in that so far. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so this is seed funding to start with. $40,000 maximum ask uh, for a proposal. They run for 18 months. Uh, the actual fund project is intended to, to last one year, and that's the timeline we'll ask for in a little bit. A one-year timeline, and then there's about six months of administrative on the front end and on the back end for closing up your project. But the money is available to you for 18 months to spend. Uh, and that includes conference travel and the like. Uh, so that's an 18-month period for these projects to run. And the hope is, the intent is, that after that 18 months is up, you are well positioned to submit for these external grants, or, uh, and increasingly, or uh, taking your idea and looking at ways to monetize that idea or to possibly commercialize that idea. Uh, most of us have heard of or are aware of President's, or President Barron's uh, Invent Penn State initiative. And the idea here is to take some of these great ideas here at Penn State and spin them up into, into companies, uh, whether that's through you uh, as the idea generator or through someone that uh, here at Penn State that partners with you to take your idea to that next level. So there are many different off-ramps for the research initiation grants, but the idea is that they are not 18 month and done, and you walk away and we, we wipe our hands and we're finished with the project. The idea is to set you up on a solid foundation that then you can move forward. So what we're going to do today is we're going to run through uh, the proposal process, we're going to run through uh, what the proposal looks like and the criteria that reviewers will be using to judge. You'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there is a pod that says helpful documents. Uh, you should be able to download any of those documents, uh, either by double-clicking on them or there may be a download files button there. Uh, these are all also available on our website, uh, but I put them here for your convenience. And they are essentially the key documents that you need at this stage for putting your proposal together uh, and thinking through your idea and giving yourself a little bit of uh, a check on whether or not you've done checked all the boxes, done what you need to do. Uh, so we'll jump right in, and the place I'm going to be, you should be able to see in my screen, the place I'm going to be bringing you through is on the COIL website, which is coil.psu.edu, and you can get there by going over to our grants uh, uh, menu, and then down to call for rig proposals. This is our official RFP. I also have a Word or a PDF version of it in those documents that I just referenced in the bottom right-hand corner. The research initiation grants, as I mentioned, are seed funding. Uh, it is provided through a share of revenue from World Campus. Uh, World Campus is reinvesting in the university to take these great ideas that, that may be able to be leveraged at World Campus and, and to advanced learning for all of Penn State. And when I say all of Penn State, let me be absolutely clear that uh, this is not all of University Park. This is all of Penn State, uh, all of the Commonwealth campuses, all the associated colleges, uh, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, this, is, this is a very open process. What we're looking for are the best ideas, not necessarily a, a certain type of person. Uh, so, eligibility. Research teams can be faculty, staff, students, and external individuals from other institutions, companies, whatever it may be. The principal investigator, however, the point, primary point of contact has to be a Penn State individual. 
So that means faculty, currently employed faculty, staff, or student here at Penn State. And it has to be someone that you intend to have in uh, under the Penn State banner for the life of the project, for the 18 months. Uh, there are things that happen. People leave, people move, people graduate, uh, and those things can be dealt with. But in your proposal, what you want to do is you want to identify a principal investigator that you have every intention and belief will be here for the, uh, for the length of the project. There are actually extra points given uh, or special consideration given for projects that are collaborative in nature, uh, particularly those that bring in other universities. Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the best people around these ideas, not necessarily just limiting it, limiting it to those individuals that you see in the hallway every single day. Uh, so we uh, give special consideration to those that um, are multidisciplinary, that look across colleges, look across units, look across campuses, uh, and as I said, look across institutions as well. Deadline, just talked about that, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, November 14th. Uh, I will tell you that I go in at 5.01 and I turn off the submission uh, form uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the rig submissions. Uh, so that is a very important time. This is, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. Uh, and if you, I, we've had this happen, so I will say if you think that you have a problem with submission, I know some of us travel internationally, uh, and sometimes uh, internet connections can be spotty. Uh, if you believe you might have an issue, cover your bases, email it to me as well, or just send me an email saying, just submitted, want to make sure that, uh, that it's there. Uh, question, if we submit early, uh, can you send in fixes? Uh, yes. Uh, so the form does not allow you to actually go in as, uh, as some of the, the federal grant systems do, allow you to go in and actually pull your proposal off and then submit a new one. What you do is you simply submit a new uh, proposal over top of the one that you had. Uh, and what I do is I take the most recent proposal sent. Again, if you have concerns, these are $40,000 grants, pretty big deals. Uh, if you have concerns, do not hesitate for a second to email me as well, just to make absolutely certain. And my email, uh, well, I'll put it in the chat box here, but it's also throughout the documents. There you go. So, use of funding. So you've got 40000 possibly $40,000 coming up to, maximum $40,000. Uh, what can you use it for? Well, we try to be as broad as possible with this. And this is, this is going to be a theme that you see throughout uh, my description of the rigs. Uh, our intent is to support you in any way that we can. Uh, we recognize how life happens, things happen. Uh, research projects change, timelines change. Uh, what we try to do is be as flexible as possible while still making absolutely certain that the work is done within the time frame that we're asking for it to be done and that uh, money is spent in a reasonable and wise way. So money can be spent on. Uh, development of new technology-based learning tools. So this may be uh, contracting services from TLT uh, for developers uh, or learning designers to help you put something together. Uh, it can be used for uh, gaining services from statisticians across the, the university or methodologists if you need to bring in individuals, uh, professionals uh, to, to review your proposal or help you in developing your methodologies. Uh, you can use it for that. Uh, you can use it for collaboration with other individuals in the field. So, say for ex example, uh, the world expert in uh, the VR technologies you, you are using is in Silicon Valley. And it is, uh, you, you need their hands-on help. Uh, the work can't be done virtually You to, uh, to successfully complete your project. You need to be in the room with that person. Funds could be used for either bringing that person here to Penn State, which is always wonderful because then we can leverage their trip for, for other things, speaking engagements and the like, or to bring you to them uh, if they have a lab that you need to be able to visit, so travel costs of that sort, uh, communication costs if you, uh, if you have international uh, uh, phone conversations. We've had some people that had to uh, purchase like a Slack platform for project development. Those types of things are all uh, perfectly uh, fine uses of, of the grant money. Uh, travel, you'll see in the bullet there. Technologies or equipment. Let me give a caveat on the tra on the equipment. We do not, uh, we will not approve, and we do not uh, get in the habit of funding purchases of equipment that you should already have available to you within your normal work at Penn State. Uh, so one example there being a standard laptop. 
uh, if it is a if you need something for writing up reports, uh, doing some some office work, uh, that is not something that you'd want to put use this money toward, and it is something that most likely would not be approved. However, if you have the need for a special development server, let's go back to my VR example, uh, you need to buy an Alienware desktop uh, to be able to support your Oculus, Oculus Rift, or you need an Oculus Rift. That is a perfectly good uh, use of this money, and it is something that you would not have in the course of your normal work here at Penn State. So that is fine. Uh, what happens is in your budget narrative that we'll get to in a little bit, you will let us know uh, what type of materials you need and reviewers will review that and I and our financial team will also review that and give pushback if there's something that is not allowed. I just noticed the question, what is TLT? Sorry about that. Uh, TLT is Teaching and Learning with Technology Unit here at Penn State University. Uh, they have a large number of developers and uh, learning designers that can sometimes uh, be leveraged for your projects to, to provide assistance on your projects. Uh, contact person for that will be Kyle Bowen. Uh, if you look at the TLT website, which um, I can't click to right now, but uh, if you look up uh, TLT at Penn State, you'll, you'll find both Kyle's information and an overview of what TLT does here at Penn State. Uh, they can be a fantastic resource. And if your project aligns with their strategic goals, sometimes they will bring their resources to bear on your project uh, without fee, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. So uh, what else can you use money on? Uh, staff compensation. Uh, so this is you know, a number of hours for hiring a, a student uh, to provide data collection or to provide some programming help. Uh, you can use it for wage dollars. Uh, you can use it for graduate assistance, including tuition and stipend if your college will not support that. Uh, very often, most often, what happens is that that cost is split between the grant and the college. Most colleges are willing to come to the table uh, to support tuition and then the stipend comes out of the rig grant. But if your college will not support that, you can use this money for both tuition and stipend. If you've ever funded a graduate assistant, you know that $40,000 does not go very far uh, with funding graduate assistants. Uh, graduate assistants are relatively expensive, uh, especially in comparison to wage dollars. Uh, so it's something that you'll need to think about, something you'll have to talk with your finance team about uh, and, and figure that out. Faculty compensation during summer, you're a 10 month employee, you need to put work into it over the summer, uh, you can use rig dollars for your compensation over those summer months. And uh, real actual replacement costs uh, for faculty time to pull them out of the classroom during the fall or spring semesters. This is separate from the summer. Let me say though that this is something we are very hesitant to do. Uh, you have to make a very compelling case for this. And one of the reasons, a logical reason, one of the reasons is that we don't want to take good teachers out of the classroom. Uh, now there are times when that is necessary and there are times when that your, your, the faculty time can be put to better use uh, during that fall or spring semester and, and specific reasons. So I'm not saying you cannot use it, and you can see right here you can, but I will tell you that you need to make a very compelling argument uh, for why we would need to uh, spend money to pull you out of, or spend that grant money to pull you out of the classroom uh, for teaching time uh, for the spring and fall semesters. Um, so just be very hesitant with that. That's uh, pro tip number one. So funding priorities. There are a few different things over and above the criteria. And you'll see some of these represented in the criteria we'll get to in a bit. Uh, but there are a few things over and above the criteria that we think about when, uh, when we review the rig proposals. And I'll talk about that review process in a little bit. Uh, number one, and this is a criteria, that the project has to align with one of COIL's research pri priorities. Uh, and these research priorities change and fluctuate as, as times change and needs of the university change. Uh, but at the moment, they, the two priorities are personalization and student retention. Uh, if you've done work in these two areas, you know that they're pretty big buckets. Uh, so many things can fit into personalization and student retention. And student retention can be used in the broadest sense of that term, of uh, both retention within a course, retention within a program, and retention at the university over course of study. Uh, so it can be any of those things. Again, a very broad definition of that. Uh, so most ideas related to learning are going to be able to fall into one of these two buckets. And uh, in order to get these points in the review, 
uh, criteria, you, they will have to align with, or you'll have to make a case that your project aligns with one of these two. Uh, and without those points, you have very little chance of success, just to be blunt, uh, very little chance of success of, of funding uh, with, without being able to, to make a compelling argument that your project addresses one of these two. Uh, some sort of promise for enhancing uh, learning through online innovations. Uh, so this basically is, look, we're looking for the big ideas here. Um, we're looking for those things that could, could change learning uh, down the road. Uh, first level, change learning for all students. Uh, second level, change learning for individuals within certain courses of study. Uh, or, you know, even, even down to course level. But when you get down to the changing level in a particular course, now you've got to make a very strong argument of why that project would successfully compete against uh, something that has a broader potential for impact. Uh, and, and so these are things to be thinking about when drafting your proposal and when uh, drafting your language in your proposal, is what is the breadth of impact of your idea? Uh, how many students can it or will it touch? Uh, and these are things that you should be incorporating into your language as you write your proposal. One thing that I often say, uh, and I do uh, a lot of consulting for individuals who are looking to write rig proposals, and one of the things that I often say is that uh, the idea is important. There is no doubt about it. But often the proposal is funded, not necessarily just the idea. And what that means is you can have a great idea, but if you can't convey it, if you can't sell that message, if you can't have the reviewer understand what you want to do and the potential impact for it, you're not going to do very well in the review process. And so it's important that you are able to tell that message, to tell that story. And one of the things to think about while telling that story is, how many people will this impact? How broad will this impact be? Um, other funding priorities, uh, as I said, collaboration both across Penn State and outside of Penn State, uh, that's very important to us. Uh, and there is no specific criteria for that, but it is an element within some of the criteria that you'll see in a minute. Funding guidelines, uh, awards up to 40 grand. Uh, so you will create a budget and your, your uh, grant request will be based on that budget and that budget will be done in, uh, in concert with your finance department. Uh, and will be done within the SIMS tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with the SIMS tool, you definitely need to reach out to your financial team uh, and your college unit department uh, in order to gain access to the SIMS tool and be able to develop your budget in it. Uh, they will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, multiple, multiple year proposals, uh, they are funded, proposals are funded a year at a time. As I said, 18 months for a dollar amount, uh, for the dollars being available. But uh, each proposal is essentially a one-year proposal for the timeline. If you have a multiple-year proposal, what you'll have to do is then you'll have to come back to the table in the, in the next rig round and make a case for the next round, uh, the next year of funding. And you will be competing against all of the other ideas that are at the table there. Now, obviously, if you have successfully completed that first year or you've had some great accomplishments in that first year, you have a very strong case for a second year of funding but you still have to come to the table to, uh, to compete for that second year of funding. Uh, and we'll get into the feedback that you get, uh, but each team will get an enormous amount of feedback. So whether you're funded or not, one of the greatest things that comes out of this proposal process is that you get an enormous amount of peer feedback on your idea and on your proposal. Uh, just last uh, round, we had over 400 reviews conducted for 30 uh, proposals. So 400 reviews total, there are over 220 pages of feedback that we provided back to those 30 principal investigators. Uh, so much of that is, is priceless uh, for both helping you refine your idea, helping you refine your proposal, and whether or not you come back to the RIGS, that feedback helps you refine your proposal for the other granting agency you might go to, uh, even going up to the NIH, NSF, and the like. So let's get into the meat of it. Uh, I haven't seen any questions popping up in, this, in the chat, but if I missed something, if you wouldn't mind typing again, I'll, I'll jump back over to that. The proposal. Uh, there is, in the uh, helpful documents, there is a document that is called the RIG Proposal Checklist. This is, I like, I like checklists. Uh, any of you, those of you who know me know that I like organization, I like checkboxes and checklists. 
so I created this for proposers. Uh, you can go into this and go through item by item and tick off to make absolutely certain you've uh, done all the things that are required in the proposal. This is essentially an uh, exact copy of what is in the RFP that we're going to go through now, uh, but that is in those documents. <laughs> you know better than most, Kyle. Uh, so, proposal. Uh, the first thing, cover page. Uh, this is just your basic, uh, we need your name, we need your affiliation, we need all the names of the individuals on your project, uh, and the basic information there. That's self-explanatory. Usually that's one page. Uh, abstract. This is where we, we get right into the tough stuff. Uh, so the first three things we ask for you, uh, of, I'm sorry, the first four things we ask of you, are to take your idea and distill it down to exactly answering exactly the question we pose. So first is the abstract, what are you doing? Answer that in 200 words. What's your big idea? Convey it in 200 words. Next, an innovation statement, also 200 words. This is the answer to the question, why is your project innovative? Period. Why is your project innovative? Don't, don't get into other things, don't make other arguments, don't do a, uh, uh, don't do a, a review of what your project could be into the, into the future, uh, don't talk about budget items in here, right down to the matter. If I sat you down and said, why is this different? Why is this innovative? This is where you answer that question in 200 words. And 200 words is hard. It is hard. And we, uh, many proposers struggle in this section. And this section is a point that we debate very often around the review table, both with the directors of COIL and with the larger review team of what message was written into that, uh, that innovation statement. And very often, proposers have trouble with that and miss the mark. And that can be the difference between funded, funded and not funded, uh, to be quite honest with you. Because this is, uh, this is the upfront material. And so this is setting the stage for the way reviewers and the directors and I are going to view the rest of your proposal. So you really have to own in on that, on that innovation statement in particular. Uh, so I'd encourage you to write that innovation statement give it to 10 of your colleagues, have them read that 200 word innovation statement and give you feedback on it until you can refine that down and get the message set. Uh, we have had over 500 reviewers uh, that have participated in the RIG program. You probably know someone who has been a reviewer before. Try to track them down, uh, ask around, and see if they will give you some feedback on that innovation statement and these other statements we're going to be talking about. Uh, that can greatly help you in, in uh, crafting the best statement you can. So innovation statement. Why is your project considered innovative? And we'll get into innovation in a second and what that means. Uh, next, impact on learning. So this kind of goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier. How is this going to, how is this going to impact learning? How, how is this going to change learning? Uh, in 200 words, tell me what that is. Cut out all the fluff. Just tell me what it is. Uh, and then the last 200 word section is alignment with COIL research priorities. Uh, so here you're basically going to tell us why this is related to personalization or student retention uh, in 200 words. With that done, and usually that takes up a couple more pages, uh, you can do those separate on each page if you like, you can combine those as long as they are no more than 200 words. I will tell you, uh, every submission is reviewed uh, in advance of sending it out to our, our broader reviewers, reviewed for uh, adherence to these guidelines. If you have 203 words, your proposal will be sent back to you and you will have 24 hours to correct it. Uh, if you do not uh, correct it, if you don't get that email for whatever reason, your proposal will never be submitted for review. Uh, so make certain you align to these guidelines. Um, I, I, can't in, I can't encourage that or emphasize that enough. Uh, it saves a lot of time on our end uh, and it will save an enormous amount of time on your end and, and avert potential disaster for your project uh, if, if uh, you just keep 200 words or less. Uh, narrative, uh, this is the meat of the project. You've got five pages, which is not much, but you've got five pages, 12 point font, play around with the, uh, with the typeface, uh, that, that's fine, uh, but five pages, double spaced, 12 point font uh, to give us the overview of your project. And what follows here is just a bullet list of what's within that narrative. 
uh, you'll see that there's a description of what the innovation is. You already did that in the 200 word section, but here you've got a little bit more space to, to build that out. Uh, what are your research or evaluation questions? Uh, so if you're doing a development project, you may have either one. Uh, if you're doing a research project, you'll probably have uh, research questions. Uh, what is the significance of the work? So what is the potential impact? Uh, a description of the of the methodology re related to it, how you're going to collect data. This obviously is going to be very brief, if you need it at all, all depending on what your project is. Um, so this is a case where it is not an NSF proposal. This is not five pages of methodology. This, is, this isn't 20 pages of methodology. This is a portion of a five-page narrative. Uh, so you don't have to get into an enormous amount of detail here. But you do have to give us uh, a sense of what you're going to do. And most importantly, you have to allay any fears that our reviewers are going to have and the directors are going to have as we read these of, Ooh, how are they going to do that? Uh, if there are questions or concerns that would come up based on the nature of your research of how you may be able to conduct that, this is the place that you respond to those questions. Most of proposal writing within this process is anticipating questions or concerns reviewers may have and addressing them in, in, in advance. Uh, and so that's what you have to do with the methodology section as well. Uh, where do you plan on submitting for external funding? Or do you plan on, on creating a company or monetizing or licensing uh, your idea? What's the future of this project, basically? Uh, what else, uh, so I get into giving enough specificity, um, reviewers are going to be reviewing this project and they're not going to have any background information on your project. They're coming in cold. They're going to read this five-page narrative and those, some of those uh, advanced statements and they're going to have to walk away understanding what you want to do and why it's worth $40,000 of, of Penn State's money, of World Campus's money. Um, so this is, a, this is the place to do that. But you, what you don't want to do is get too mired down in jargon and in uh, details that only those within your specific domain may understand. Uh, we do our best to align reviews with experts uh, within your content domain, but we, uh, these are uh, re uh, volunteer reviewers across the Penn State community. And so they may not uh, understand or know the exact jargon that you're using. What they are experts in is learning and innovations in learning. Uh, and so that's the audience that you're speaking to, which again is going to be slightly different than an NSF type proposal. And keep that in mind when you're writing uh, your proposal. Make this accessible, but at the same time specific enough that people can understand uh, what, is, what you're looking to do. And there may be an individual on the review team uh, that is a content specialist for the domain you're, you're working in, uh, so you need to be able to allay their fears or concerns or questions as well. And then lastly, in this five-page section, you have to have a timeline. Uh, and that's a 12-month timeline. Uh, you may have a couple things a little beyond that 12 months since the funding is available for 18 months. But as you all know, closing down uh, a research project, uh, doing your travel for conferences and like, that's usually what happens in that last six-month period. Uh, what you don't want to do is have a timeline that goes up until the very last day uh, for for critical components of the project because once that 18 months is over you have no funding uh, so the question is how are you going to wrap all that up if your timeline goes all the way to 18 months so uh, that's all within that five page section next you have references uh, this is one page if you have relevant references uh, you can put those in that one page section team bios uh, this is where and there's no page limit on here you'll notice uh, this is a brief bio, bio of each one of your key team members. Uh, one of the questions people ask very often is, what's an ideal size team? I will tell you that we have had proposals that have had team sizes from 1 to 28. Uh, 28 would lead to some questions for me of how are you going to manage a team of 28 uh, individuals on this project. Uh, and what I think they probably meant was that some of those individuals would be consultants. And so this is something you can do for your team member uh, listing, is list those individuals that are involved in your project. That if I ran into them in the hallway and said, how is the project doing? They'd be able to respond to me because they're in the know, because there's some sort of regular contact. Uh, 
uh, you do not want individuals listed on that project team that if I ran into they'd say what project? Um, those individuals can be listed as consultants, uh, individuals that maybe you reach out to once or twice over the life of the project uh, to give some information, but they wouldn't be your core team members. Core teams should be, and there's no restriction here, but I'm just giving you my advice, uh, right around six to eight individuals maybe, or less. Uh, I would not go over eight uh, because uh, that would, again, call into question of whether these individuals were actually team members or whether they are consultants in some way whatsoever. So, uh, you give a list of the team members and their capabilities. This would be for that shorter list of individuals. Uh, and try to keep those bios relevant to the project. Uh, so what you don't want to do, there's no page limit here, but what you don't want to do is give a two-page bio for every member on the team uh, with an enormous amount of information that is not relevant to your project. Uh, so key into those relevant pieces of information, their experience running projects, their experience in this domain, their experience with the methodologies you're using, those sorts of details. Budget, uh, you're going to reach out to your finance team to use the PSU SIMS tool for developing your budget. Uh, and there are some details in here that you can go over with your finance team for what that includes. Uh, there will also be a narrative that goes along with that. So you give the actual spreadsheet of the budget and then you give a narrative that explains what are those lines on the budget, what do they mean, what are they going to be used for. Dissemination plan is your next thing. It's going to be a, not to exceed one page, so one page. Uh, this is basically how are you going to let other people know about your work. Uh, extra points for, extra virtual points uh, for leveraging Penn State resources, uh, COIL conversations, COIL Fisher talks, uh, going to the TLT symposium, those sorts of things, uh, even uh, developing an event at Penn State uh, to, to disseminate your work uh, or to put together a working group. Uh, as well as conferences, conference travel, and the like. Now, this is new, asterisk, star, uh, blinking light. Uh, this is new to the, to, the, uh, to the RFP. It's never been there before, but it is addressing a problem and concern that we have had a number of times in the past. We are now requiring two letters of support minimum. You can get as many letters of support as you want, but there are two key ones that we need. First, we need a letter of, to see a letter of support from your FO, from your financial officer, indicating a willingness to support the project. Basically what this means, and, the, and there's a sample letter that you can download. It is very basic, uh, so here it is. Uh, it is basically saying that if you are awarded the grant, they will support you in running the grant because you cannot do that alone. Uh, there are systems that you need access to, uh, there are approvals that need to be done. There are uh, da data entry tasks that need to be done that you cannot do without your finance department. Uh, and we have had a couple situations where uh, people have gotten all the way to the uh, funding stage and it's the first time their finance department has heard of the project. You need to do this in advance. So there are sample letters that you can download. Have your FO fill them in. Most of the colleges at this point at, at Penn State are well aware of the COIL rig process and, uh, and will not be surprised by this letter coming to their desk. Uh, so you need one from your finance department. You also need one from your HR office, from a human resources officer. And there is another sample letter that you can get uh, for your HR uh, individual. Uh, and basically what they're going to do, they're going to sign that they're going, you are going to include it in your proposal and we will then know that both your finance and HR staff are on board and, and knowledgeable of your project, uh, that if you are funded they will be willing to support it. Uh, so those two things are new, uh, but it is extremely critical that you have those. Again, if they are not included, I will send the proposal back to you 24 hours to get a fix, which is going to be really tough for getting these kinds of letters. 24 hours to fix it. If it's not fixed, it will not be sent on for review. Uh, and then supporting material, you can put as much supporting material in there as you want. I would caution you, uh, pro tip number two, uh, I would caution you to keep it reasonable. Uh, we have had individuals that have put over 30 pages of supporting materials in. If you put in 30 pages of materials, uh, the reviewers are not required to read through these supporting materials outside of the core proposal, uh, and they most likely will not if you put that much information in. However, 
If you put in two pages of supporting material that are really key and relevant to your project, they'll probably be reviewed. Uh, they'll probably be read. If this is the place that is best to put in links, web links, if you have relevant web links, if you have, uh, if you have screenshots, pictures speak a thousand words, uh, if you have screenshots of something you're developing or an interface you have or, or something relevant to your project, this is where you can put those in. Uh, that, that's this supporting material section. And as I said, there is no page limit. You can do what you will in there. Um, but I caution you just be, uh, be mindful when putting those materials together. So proposal submission, you will go to the rig submission form, which if you go to the top of the screen and you go to coil.psu.edu and you go to grants, you will see rig submission form. When you click on there, it is a straightforward and easy form. You will fill in these fields, you will click where you're from, your affiliations, you will upload your proposal, and you'll let us know a couple things, uh, a couple pieces of background information, and you hit submit. Uh, you will then receive a pop-up notice as well as an email uh, letting you know that your proposal has been received. Once we receive that proposal, and this is getting to those important dates in the bottom left-hand corner, once you, we get your proposal, uh, I review them immediately. The next day you will receive an email if there are any problems with your proposal, if you've gone over word limits or you're missing something. Uh, you'll have 24 hours to correct, and then they are sent out to the reviewers. Uh, the reviews go on for a little under two weeks. Uh, reviews will be done by November 30th. On November 30th, uh, the reviewers are completed. They've given us your scores. I tally those scores. Uh, we have a rig reviewer meeting where we bring in the roughly 70 reviewers that have conducted reviews, and we talk through your projects and we give reviewers opportunities to change their scores, to update their scores, to uh, make a case for a project that they feel is very important or that they feel maybe the other reviewers missed the point on or, or missed some information. And so what we come out of that meeting with a final score for your proposal. Now let me, let me emphasize this point because this is another point of confusion. Just had a conversation with someone about this uh, on Friday. Those reviewer scores are brought to uh, the director's table, COIL director's table. Uh, there will be eight of us sitting around the table, seven of us sitting around the table. And we will go through the proposals. We use the reviewer scores as guidance for selecting funded proposals. Now, we greatly respect the reviewer scores and the work that the reviewers put in. So we give them quite a bit of credence. However, there are, the final decision for funding is made at that director's table. Uh, you can view it as a second level of review. And at that director's table, we will decide whether or not we deviate uh, from those reviewer scores in providing funding. Uh, so there are two different levels of review there. First, the broader review community, and then second, at the uh, director's table. At that point, we will make a decision as to which projects are funded, and on uh, December 8th, we will announce the funded projects. As I've already mentioned, January 1st, money is in hand. So, that's the proposal. That's what we're asking for from you. Now, the question is, how do you write the best proposal possible? Well, how do you make certain that you're funded? And that's what we provide in this last section, which is criteria for project selection. And more importantly, also in those helpful documents, you will see the RIG review rubric. Uh, so what this is, is it gives each one of the criteria that is listed in that RFP. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see the criteria. And then it gives the reviewers guidance on assignment of points related to that criteria. This gives you every tool you need to be able to write your proposal, share your proposal with colleagues along with this rubric, and have them help you in refining your proposal to give you the best chance for funding. Uh, this is the same exact material that is going to be provided to the COIL reviewers. Uh, so there is no difference there. We are completely transparent, uh, and this will provide you with the opportunity to to do a little bit of, uh, of testing of your idea and your proposal in advance of actual submission. Uh, so we're a little short on 
time as far as submission goes, so you, you need to be getting your idea pretty uh, together pretty quickly to send this out. Uh, but you will see point values, you will see the uh, criteria and the guidance that we give. So what are the criteria? Innovation, 10 points. Largest number of points in, in a category uh, is 10. Uh, so innovation is that 10 points. And we give a definition here of innovation because there's been some confusion here as to what is innovative, what isn't. Uh, we define innovation. I'll read this because we we have refined this down and we have gone through a number of different uh, variations of this innovation uh, definition until we've really gotten it down to the key points. So innovation is research, development, or introduction of something new or novel, being an idea, device, or approach with the intent of improving learning. New and novel are the two of the key words in here. And so when you're making your case in that innovation statement, when you're making your case in that five pages, what you need to be able to do is say, does this make the case that my idea is new or novel? If it is not, then perhaps you need to go back in and refine the proposal. Give some examples of how your idea is different than that other thing that everybody's going to be thinking about uh, when they read your proposal. Is there something close to what you're looking at doing, but it misses a key element. You need to make that case in your proposal, and that's the new and novel argument. Um, so innovation is critical when you're writing your proposal. Enhancing learning, uh, this is, again, uh, making a case that your project enhances learning uh, both in the short and long term uh, and has potential for broad impact. Ten points, again, you'll notice, so a large, a large chunk here. Alignment with coil theme personalization student retention, again, 10 points. I promise you they're not all 10 points. Um, so does it align with the ideas of personalization and retention? And we define those for you here uh, in case you want that. The R&D team, the research and development team, is well prepared to execute the project. So basically this is, can this team do it? Uh, do they have any evidence that they can run a project like this? Do they have any evidence that they can spend $40,000 wisely? Uh, this is worth five points. Applicability, uh, so this is the uh, beneficial impact beyond the initial course or context. So this is uh, broad use of this idea or broad impact of this idea. Uh, and can this be used outside of Penn State? Again, we, we didn't define this as projects that can uh, improve learning at Penn State. Of course, Penn State's important, but we're looking beyond Penn State as well. So can this impact Penn State and then move even, even further? Cost-effectiveness, seven points. Is this a good use of money? Uh, or are we spending $40,000 and we're not getting much out of it? Uh, so you need to make the case here. Feasibility, uh, can it be done in time allotted? So uh, you can look at this and say, read a proposal and say, there's no way they're going to do that in a year. Uh, we have in, had individuals who said that they were going to uh, build from the ground up a, a, a piece of software as well as run research around that software. Uh, that would be very difficult to do in a year. And if you are doing something as ambitious as that, you need to make certain that you make the case in your proposal that you can. Uh, and this is where team bios are very important because you need to make the case that your team can do this. Research evaluation plan, uh, 10 points again. Uh, are your research questions in there? Is it reasonable? Can you do this? Are the, uh, are the uh, assessments linked to the objectives, those sorts of things, uh, appropriate methodology, uh, 10 points. Potential to generate subsequent research and funding, uh, can, does this idea have legs? Will this $40,000 grant be able to turn into a $2 million grant down the line? Um, five points here, uh, beyond just that external grant money, can this, is this idea potentially the foundation for bigger ideas? Uh, that's another case that can be made. That maybe this project won't get those huge grants, but in order to get those huge grants, you need this as the first step. Uh, so that's a case that can be made as well within the proposal. And finally, dissemination plan, three points. Uh, so basically, how are you going to let other people know about this? Is an appropriate plan? Will you be able to spread the message? You will notice here, that there is a scoring rubric that you can download. It's the same one that's in the helpful document section. Uh, and you can download that rubric and use it uh, in any way that you see fit. We give you a couple different uh, highly rated proposals from the past, uh, two of them. 
what I'm going to emphasize here, and it says it in the text, but I'm going to emphasize that these are uh, proposals that were submitted under different RFPs. So they may not perfectly align with what this RFP is. Uh, so be very careful in using them. What they do is they demonstrate uh, very thoughtful and concise ways of putting together a proposal. And uh, the exempl they are exemplars of getting your message across, of telling the story of what your project is. Uh, so these are two very good examples. Uh, they are redacted, uh, so I apologize for that. But there are some pieces of information that, that we don't want publicly available. Uh, but for the most part, you can, you can get a good sense of what a proposal should look like based on these. And just make certain you then go through the checklist and make certain that you have everything that's required for this RFP. Um, expectations, we're not really going to get into this, uh, but you can see the expectations What uh, if you do get the $40,000, what do we expect you to do? Uh, the only thing I will point out is that uh, this is Penn State money for Penn State people. Uh, and so you are required to follow all research and, and IP policies, intellectual property policies uh, at the university in the use of this fund, uh, this funding. Uh, and I'll actually add to that finance uh, policies. Uh, so you can only use this money in a way that is, uh, that is allowed here at Penn State. And there are policies regarding the use of these funds that can be uh, somewhat strict at times. And there's no way around that. These are not unrestricted funds. Uh, these are Penn State funds. Now, I noticed I was trying to glance as we were going through uh, why you're here. And I saw some of you have ideas. Some of you are, are looking to be reviewers. Some of you are just curious. Um, if, you, if you are submitting this, this fall, you cannot be a reviewer. Obvious conflict of interest there. Uh, but if you are thinking that perhaps you may be submitting in the spring, which uh, spring date is May 12th, 2017, will be the, the next round of, of rigs after the fall. If you are looking for the spring, I would highly encourage you to, uh, to volunteer to be a reviewer for this round, for this fall round. Because what it does is it allows you to, uh, to stretch your wings a little bit in, in the use of this, this, uh, this rubric in really understanding what the projects are like that are submitted, uh, what your competition is going to be uh, in this process. Uh, and it gives you a good sense of this whole process, which will give you a significant leg up for the next round. Uh, so if you are not submitting in the fall, I would highly encourage you to be a reviewer. Generally, um, you're probably going to have three uh, projects, uh, proposals that would be assigned to you as a reviewer. Uh, everyone is different in how much time that takes. I would say in general it's going to be about three hours, uh, three to five hours maybe of work, uh, some less, some more, uh, depending on, on your work style and, and how thorough you are. Uh, but it is not a significant uh, dedication of time and I think the payoff if you're going to be a submitter will be uh, well worth that amount of time for you. Uh, as well as the fact, quite honestly, that you just get a sense of some of the most innovative work being done at this university. And that is so exciting. So one of my favorite parts of this entire process is you, you can look in that window of the new and innovative and exciting things being done here at the university. And it gives you a sense of what, of what learning what teaching is going to look like five years down the road, ten years down the road. It's really exciting to do that. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit of an investment of time, uh, but I think the payoffs are well worth it. Now, uh, down this bottom section, uh, information session, so it has a link to uh, today's session. That will be replaced very soon uh, with a recording of this session, uh, so that if you need to or want to share it with anyone and your, your colleagues, anyone else you uh, think is going to be submitting or is interested, uh, you can you can point them to that. It'll be up on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you follow us on any of our social media, which you'll notice on the top uh, right corner of our website, are links to all of our social media uh, that you can follow us on or email uh, list. Uh, you will also receive a notice when this goes up uh, via those those networks. So that is the overview. Uh, and just about right on time there. So I'll give you a couple minutes to type questions if you have questions over in the, uh, in the chat box. Uh, but what I'll do is give you uh, a couple pieces of, of advice uh, that has 
uh, come through or that I often tell those that I consult with. First of all, is that that service is available. If you have an idea, if you are writing a proposal and you just would like another set of eyes on it, uh, that is something that we are willing to do. Uh, I have removed myself from, uh, from having a, a vote or an input in the selection of, of these proposals. Uh, and basically I see myself as chief advocate for every proposal uh, at the table when, when we're discussing these. Uh, so that what that does is that opens me up to be able to sit down with you and talk about uh, your idea, how to refine your idea, how to best frame your idea within this uh, proposal process, uh, and how to write your proposal. And what I do offer is to read your proposal and give you feedback on it uh, based on the experience that I, that I have uh, both in this world and, and within the rig process in particular. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Keith, uh, the three to five hours is overall. Uh, again, you, you see what the proposal is. It's uh, basically six pages, five pages plus some of those additional materials. Uh, so it's reading that and going through the review process of giving scores on each one of those criteria. Uh, what I've heard from, from reviewers in the past is that it takes about an hour to an hour and a half uh, per proposal. And, uh, and if you put that over three proposals that you'll be reviewing, that, that gives you a sense. Uh, when I say three proposals, that may change. Uh, so it all depends on how many submissions we get and how many um, reviewers we get. I will give you our, our averages. Uh, our average is 70 reviewers, 70 reviewers per cycle, and 30 submissions is what we are averaging now uh, per cycle. Uh, to Put the put this in context. So we will have 30 submissions uh, again, based on our, our most recent averages, 30 submissions, and we will most likely be funding three uh, proposals. So what that means is that there are great ideas that are not going to be funded through this process, and and there are things that we do to try to find other types of support for the ideas that that don't make the cut for the rigs. Uh, we don't. Again, this is a different kind of grant process and you're probably used to, we feel a certain kinship with those who are submitting their ideas. And so I represent your ideas after the fact, after the, the, uh, the rig process. I represent your ideas to a few groups around campus trying to see if I can get any additional support uh, from other units uh, for those that we're not be able to bring rig money to. Uh, so. Uh, Three projects will be funded, that means 27 won't. And this is where it comes down to uh, the way you write your proposal. As I said early on, it's not always the idea that is funded, it's the, it's the proposal that's funded. Uh, and there can be two ideas and the funding decision is based on the way that each one was represented inside the proposal, the story that you told, and the coherence of that story. Uh, so it is critical that you not just get your ideas done on paper, but refine them and tweak them to, test, to convey the best message. And that is going to be of great help both in this process and when you're looking at other funding sources down the road. Uh, so hopefully this can be a, a great benefit to you, whether or not you ever join uh, the Rig PI family uh, and, and, and get that, that grant funding. Thanks, Allison. Thanks for being here. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I will I will leave with saying, uh, reach out to me if you have any questions whatsoever. Do not hesitate to uh, to call or email. I am putting in my phone number right there. Uh, oops, through an extra period there. Sorry about that. Uh, three eight zero nine three one nine. Yeah, the number is correct. Uh, ignore the period. Uh, that's my phone number. Uh, email is, is already in the chat. You can reach out to me at any point whatsoever. I will help in any way that I possibly can. I uh, look forward to seeing your ideas. Uh, and, um, and again, appreciate you being here and appreciate you uh, submitting your ideas. Thanks.